This is Free to Exchange, the show where free thinking scholars, free markets, and, ironically, free public television all meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. On today's episode, we're going to look at economic systems very different than our own, see how they function compared to freer economic systems, and examine how they've transformed over time. First up is the former Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries. Joining me now is Dr. Peter Betke. Dr. Betke is the university professor of both economics and philosophy at George Mason University, as well as the bb and professor for the study of capitalism at the Mercatus System. He also sits on our very own Texas Tech Free Market Institute Board of Directors. He's author of seven books, including The Political Economy of Soviet Socialism and Why Perestroika Failed. Dr. Betke, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ben. It's so. Let's start with the Soviet Union and, and where it was before the transformation. So people you know, would hear slogans, you know, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And it was supposedly a centrally planned system where the government nationalized all of the factors that go into making goods and services, and then allocated via a central plan how to do all of their production so that nobody had property rights in, in, the, in businesses. Is this how it really operated? No, that's not how it really operated, but it is how it would pretend it to operate. But because of problems associated with economic calculation, that is the ability for central planners to know the how, what, and for whom of economic systems. Uh, I and mean, that's the key of an economic system key is of how, an econ what, and, and for whom. Yeah, and they, they didn't have any means to answer that. So instead, what you got was a kind of a weird inner lock system in which what? you had a... Wait a, wait a second, wait a second. Why couldn't they answer that? Because of the problem of economic calculation, which Ludwig von Mises was the first major thinker to identify, and that is that uh, because they didn't have private property, they didn't have prices. Without prices, they don't have relative scarcity indicators, and as a result, they didn't know whether or not to build the railroad tracks out of platinum or out of steel. And they couldn't make these assessments to engage in these giant economic plans. Right. So, okay. So it's not just the, that they weren't smart enough or didn't have scientific knowledge. They could know all of the engineering. Yes. But that doesn't tell you which metal you should put into something or whether you should use more labor and less, fewer machines. Those are economic trade-offs that we need these prices for. Right. Okay. So if they didn't have that, obviously they can't centrally plan it. So how did they? Well, first thing is that they relied on Sears catalog. <laughs> Sears do, catalog was our, that our they got opinion. you know world prices and so they would try to price products based on consumer prices on, on Sears catalog but second off they what they did in terms of advanced uh, sort of uh, stages of production is that you would have uh, factories which would try to meet these planned output targets um, there's an old Soviet cartoon which shows that they uh, produced a one ton nail because they were told produce a ton of nails and so they'd produce one ton nail and then they'd say well we met our output target you mm -hmm. know give us our bonuses so all the different kind of systems that they tried to establish for incentives didn't quite work so what happened in the system was you had an official sector a black market and consumer goods and then an unofficial planned economy sector which would steal from the state then try to funnel it into the consumer sector. And this, this sort of three-pronged approach, where you have an official economy, an unofficial economy, and then this third economy, which is sort of um, like a negotiator between the state enterprises. So one state enterprise would have too many of this you know, input, and then this, they would you know, negotiate with them to get it over here. Um, and this was middleman was called the Tokachi. And uh, you know, he kind of tried to arrange things. Um, and that's the only way they kind of stumbled through, is that you would have the frustration in the official sector led to a frustration in the consumer sector, which would be attempt to be appeased through the black market, but there's no alternative supply network. And so these shortage economies that um, existed and were uh, starting to fray apart in the 1960s, it stumbled upon in the 70s. They went through a period of where they tried to introduce partial reforms in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and eventually, of course, the system fell apart in the 1980s. Um, that, uh, that is the system that they were transitioning from, not the ideal top-down planning kind of uh, system. So while nobody officially had property rights like we do in the United States here, unofficially, they had kind of control rights then. Right. And so you. You have control rights, but not cash flow rights. 
So what you did was you tried to use that to be able to get bribes. So it was a bribing economy. In fact, one of Western economists in 1956, after Stalin died, there was a period of time where Western economists were allowed access into the system. And during one of those, uh, those uh, sort of studies, an economist uh, pointed out the idea that in Russian language, they, they used to say that uh, blat, which means corruption or bribes, is higher than Stalin. So <laughs> blat was higher than Stalin, so the way they negotiated things. So imagine like everything that you've heard about, say, in India, customs officials, which in order to get your goods out, you had to bribe them. Or, you know, you think about New York City with rent control uh, apartments, and you have to pay a key fee to get access to the rent control apartment. Or, uh, you know, taxi cab, you know, in, in sure. any major city. That's kind of how this system was set up all along the way. The entire economy. Entire economy. A shortage was like the, economy yeah. with de facto kind of control rights over things that people use to extract bribes. Right. So when the, the Iron Curtain kind of fell and Western advisors all go over there, you know, there's pictures of Jeff Sachs, right, in one video says, yeah. oh yes, I wrote their constitution overnight <laughs> and some <laughs> absurd stuff like this. So did the Western advisors understand what they were reforming or did they think they were reforming what was on paper? Well, the first, you know, run of them uh, was really focused on what was on paper, and so they kind of misdiagnosed the reforms. But after a while, several of them were in there. I mean, one of uh, Andre Schleifer, who was an economist at Harvard, uh, was very good at, at pointing out about this issue of property rights and how you can get the property rights. He wrote a book with a guy named Maxime Boyko, which is called Privatizing Russia, which actually talks about t taking these control rights and then somehow giving them cash flow rights. But, you know, the original people of reform, which brought over what was called the Washington Consensus, uh, they tended to think that they were reforming something not that was in the reality, but was on paper. And as a result, there was a lot of missteps taken in the beginning. So if you were uh, understanding how their economy actually operated, if you were in charge of doing that, what advice would you give of how do you make a successful reform? What do they need? Well, it's kind of, you know, that's a very big question, obviously, but we have some evidence of this in other examples. Uh, Hernando de Soto uh, wrote a book in the 1980s, I think, called The Other Path, which was the problem in Latin American countries with a heavy degree of red tape, and as a result, a sort of bribe economy, underground economy, and whatnot. And one of his arguments was, look, recognize the existing de facto rights codify them into existing rights and then allow trade to take place and you'll see trade the swapping of property rights to higher valued uses and i think to a large extent that actually would have been the policy that that could have been followed to recognize the existing rent rights allow the individuals to then engage in exchange and re-swap the rights and i think that would have been much better than any of these other grand schemes that they had in mind, which would invoke so much politics and, and uh, involvement all along. Because one of the most important things in the reform from post-communist countries was to eliminate the discretionary role of the state in economic affairs. And by continuing to rely on the state to be the guide of all the reforms every step of the way, all you did was reinforce the idea that the state was then the source of economic reform. The more things change, the more they stay, stay the, the same. same. Yeah. So some countries, and of course, so I think this is great, you recognize property rights and then allow competition and, and markets. We talk right. about this on free to exchange here right. all the time. Of course, one of the problems is some of their property rights weren't worth a darn once you figured out that with market yeah. prices, they, yeah. they've got a pile of junk. Uh, but some countries, we look these up, some have been successful, more successful than others. Uh, Georgia is one of the, so there's these rankings of freest economies in the world. And in the top quarter of that index around the whole world, Georgia is in there, Armenia, Estonia, Romania, Montenegro. Yeah. Uh, particularly Georgia is as high as 16 in the world. But then you've got places that are still garbage, like Serbia, Ukraine. Uh, you know, they're in the bottom quarter of the index. Russia sits right around 100, I think. Yeah. So... Why have some of them been more successful than others, do you think? Or what's the problem with this? That the well, I think it goes back to this issue of, well, in some of these countries, they were very fortunate to have very uh, sort of um, 
visionary leaders. So Estonia, for example, had Mart Lahr, who was a very uh, strong leader, follower of Milton Friedman, had read Milton Friedman and said, that's the way we need to go. And so the, with the tide of, uh, of ideas, we're going to bring in a flat tax system. We're going to try to be a gateway to Europe, to all of e Eastern countries. flat Central. and low. Flat and low tax, yeah. And try to be uh, you know, a, a gateway to all of Western civilization coming in and, and, and all of that. And so Estonia was great. In fact, I gave a speech uh, many years ago in Prague, and this is a um, um, sort of a little bit of hyperbola, but I was talking, it was at the time when the countries were talking about joining the EU. And if you join the EU, a country like Estonia was actually going to become less free than it was under Mart Lahr. And yeah. I went to my knees and I prayed like I was praying <laughs> to God and I said, please, Lord, do not let Estonia join the EU. And this audience looked at me in just in absolute horror because in a lot of these countries, joining the EU actually made them more free. Right. So if, because if the Ukraine converged to EU standards, yeah, that it would, would be, be a yes, pro great. But, uh, you know, but Estonia, not so much. Right. But, uh, but yeah, so if you look at these countries, there's usually... And Georgia has amazing free market leaders there now free, too. They had a rough patch for a long time. But... Right. That's changed. Yeah, and, and so you look and there's these very strong uh, leaders who push through reforms which don't make themselves the rulers over other men but allow people to have freedom of choice and freedom of exchange. So we've got just a, a minute left here. So what's the biggest barrier for continued reform in, in the places that aren't doing as well, the Ukraine and the Soviet Union, say? Well, I think it's a political and legal uh, system that doesn't recognize property, contract, and consent. You know, what you really need to have a thriving economy is an economy which recognizes that you have property, private property rights, transference of those property rights by consent, and the keeping of promises. And if you don't have a system that embeds that in your economic system, you're not going to be able to realize the benefits from free exchange. And that's the key issue for economic growth. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. It's, it's great to have you here at Texas Tech and look forward to having you back. I'm thrilled to be here. What was economic life like under the apartheid system in South Africa? Our next guest is both an economist who studied the system, but he also lived under it. Stick around. Free to Exchange is a joint project of Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and Texas Tech Public Media. More information is available at fmi.ttu.edu. What if television could sweep us away to another time and place? Very nice, my lady. And could take us from the Gilded Age to the Great War. From the heat of the chase to the heart of a queen. No one tells stories like PBS. Give to your PBS station and help bring stories like these to life. Your favorite PBS shows, ready to watch when you are. Anytime, any place. Find more ways to explore than ever before. Joining me now is Dr. Peter Lewin. Dr. Lewin is clinical professor of managerial economics at the University of Texas at Dallas. While Dr. Lewin works mostly on capital theory and macroeconomic topics now, some of his earlier research was on the economics of discrimination, a topic that he had a lot of experience in witnessing firsthand while he grew up in apartheid-era South Africa. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben. I'm really delighted to be here. Oh, it's great to have you in particular to be able to talk about this topic. So I guess to start with, uh, back when you started doing research related to the economics of discrimination, you were at University of Chicago earning your PhD. Gary Becker was your advisor, who of course was famous for his work on discrimination. Is that what attracted you to it, or was it your experience growing up in South Africa that got you interested in that topic? Oh, it's absolutely the latter, the fact that I grew up in South Africa. Because uh, interestingly enough, when I came to Chicago, I was not uh, that interested in labor economics or in those topics. I had uh, really focused on monetary economics, you know, mm -hmm. something that I came back to later. Uh, but once I got to the University of Chicago and I discovered uh, Gary Becker there and that he had done his dissertation under Milton Friedman right. on the uh, economics of discrimination, so it was a natural fit. I mean, I just couldn't resist it. So actually, for our, our viewers out here, why don't we define this to, to start us off with. What, what, were, what were the apartheid policies? What was it? Okay. Well, uh, the uh, nationalist government came to power in 1948 in South Africa. 
the year that I was born, by the way. And uh, the national, the, uh, the national is not causation. No, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> just pure coincidence. But it did influence my life, as you can imagine. Uh, the nationalist, it was called the Nationalist Party, and uh, the, the population dynamics in the history of South Africa are very interesting. You have a number of different uh, cultures clashing, and this overlays with race. And in particular, among the white population, there were two language groups. One that spoke Afrikaans, which was a derivative of Dutch, the original colonizers of South Africa, right. and the other who spoke English. And the English pretty much co-aligned with the economic interests, and the Dutch, the Afrikaners, pretty much co-aligned with the uh, political interests, which really were interests of, of white workers that ironically uh, learned their socialist methods uh, from the workers who had come from England. And uh, the Nationalist Party came into power on the promise basically to protect white workers from competition from black workers. And they instituted this uh, policy of apartheid. Apartheid means, in Afrikaans, separateness, loosely translated as separate development, right. and also touted as separate but equal. So they sort of, the rhetoric, they sold it to the world or to, the, to their own consciences. Sure, and at the same time, we were using phrases like separate but equal here in the United States. Yes. Of course, it might have been separate, but it wasn't equal. Exactly. The, and separate can really never be equal in that sense. Uh, it's, there are very large parallels at that time between what was going on here in the South and with the state governments and what was going on in South Africa with the national government. You know, I think there's a perception a lot of times from people in the United States that it was just pure racism in South Africa. But what you were pointing to is that there's more of a kind of economic motivation for it at its base. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing, Ben, is that racism is something that uh, discrimination, prejudice, these are some things that have potential in all human societies. But they, they seldom rise to the level of a systematic force in society unless they have some kind of uh, backing, unless they have some sort of leverage in, in government programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you find this in the South in America and you found it in South Africa. So, uh, uh, it often uh, aligns with paranoia. Uh, the economist who pointed this out most clearly was a wonderful uh, economist, uh, originally from England, his name was uh, William Hutt. Mm -hmm. He actually spent his last years in, in Dallas, Texas. And he wrote a book called The Economics of the Color Bar, where he pointed out how this was not simply racism, but racism in the service of protection of certain groups from competition. Right, if I recall actually, one of the uh, miners' unions in South Africa, their, their slogan was, workers of the world unite for a white South Africa or something like that, wasn't yes, it? Yes, very much so. So it was they wanted to protect themselves because there was a large black population. They didn't want to see their wages undercut by them, right? Yes, exactly. In, fa in fact, this uh, predates the apartheid era. Uh, ironically, the going back at least to about 1912, 1910, 1912, labor strikes and, and, and uh, trade unions, white trade unions, they instituted a policy that was very ironically known as the civilized labor policy. The civilized labor policy. Right. What was the civilized labor policy? It was basically job reservation, reserving certain jobs for white workers and white workers only. Didn't they even do it under the guise of like safety or something like that too, of the civilized, of like, of we want to make sure that these workers can do these safe jobs in the mine? Well, they yeah. used all manner of excuses mm -hmm. uh, to do it. But basically, uh, there was safety and also the excuse that uh, it, was, it was for, for uh, workplace harmony, for racial harmony, mm -hmm. so that there shouldn't be clashes. You know, that basically the idea was that uh, people of different races are, are naturally to be kept separate uh, in the interests of peace and cooperation. Now, of course, a business owner or a capitalist he has an interest in having peace and harmony in his business, and he wouldn't need a regulation to tell him to do that, right? Oh, so yeah. how, did, how did the business owners or the capitalists feel about this system? Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, one of the puzzles is that while, uh, you know, uh, employers really have an interest in employing the, uh, the, the person for the job who is competent at the lowest price. And uh, so the main industries that were affected at this period in South Africa were mining. Mm -hmm. Diamond and particularly gold and other minerals. And uh, the white uh, employers, uh, Anglo-American, the precursor of De Beers, uh, 
uh, were very much aware of the fact that they could get uh, uh, cheaper labor from the black population. And it was in their interest really to break down this color bar and to, to, to open up the workplace. However, the uh, labor strikes in 1912 and then later, later on in the 1920s established uh, a pattern whereby the employers were basically intimidated into never, for decades after that, going against the interests of the white unions. Mm -hmm. So ironically enough, and something that is not very well known, the white employers really had an interest in the breakdown of apartheid and were instrumental finally in the transition way, down, way into, the, into the 1980s in, 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 in uh, negotiating that, uh, br that uh, you know, transition from apartheid to, uh, sure. to a new society. And moving towards a more free market system right. minimizes this type of, I mean, this is actually classic Gary Becker, right? Right. Of if you have to pay the penalty for your racism in the market, you're gonna do less of it. Right. Uh, so as we saw markets expand in South Africa, we started seeing a transition away from the discrimination as much? Yes, what is not well known, what is not well uh, understood, and what I had a really hard time explaining uh, in, during the apartheid period when I used to speak, for example, to mixed race audiences, is that in a free market system, the discriminator pays a price. Right. There is a price for discrimination, a natural price. And, uh, and th that means that non-discriminators have a, a competitive advantage. Right, by pays a price you mean they're paying too much for their labor or they're not getting the most qualified person because they're indulging their prejudices. Right, for example, if, I'm, if I uh, have a preference for hiring only white workers, whereas I could hire black workers equally qualified at a lower price, I am in effect fining myself. Mm -hmm. And anybody who is a non-discriminator has lower costs of production. Mm -hmm. So the non-discriminators tend to expand at the expense of the discriminators. Right. If the system is allowed to operate. If the free market's allowed to yeah, operate. Yeah, if the system, yeah. Which the, it wasn't in apartheid no, Africa. No, it was not. Yeah. So how did the transition happen? How did eventually in the 1980s the system start to break down? You kind of indicated the capitalists finally started to push them more away from it. How did that happen? Yeah, well, the interesting thing is that, that uh, uh, controls breeding controls. As the, as the system became more and more entrenched, the costs of apartheid became, started rising more and more. In order to implement this uh, grand vision of apartheid separate development, the government actually entered upon a period of central planning whereby they wanted to actually uh, decentralize industries to the so-called border regions, the black areas, so that they wouldn't have to deal with the large numbers of, of black in-migration. Mm -hmm. So this cost a fortune trying to relocate or trying to locate industries where they would not naturally have been. Right. And the costs just kept on mounting up and up and up until, uh, until breaking point, until young, uh, you know, uh, Afrikaans politicians and businessmen began to realize that the system wasn't working. Basically, actually much like the first half of this episode when we learned about the internal contradictions within the Soviet system. Very much like that, yes. The same thing. So um, what's it like today in South Africa? We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, is it a free market economy today or is it just not as regimented as it was before? Well, you know, Ben, it's a mixed bag. I watch it uh, from afar with, uh, with expectation and, 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 and a little bit of, uh, uh, of angst. Uh, because in the person of, ne of Nelson Mandela, uh, South Africa was able to avoid, for the most part, bloodshed and, and strife and was able to uh, embark upon a fairly peaceful transition. Nelson Mandela, although the opposition, the ANC party to which he was uh, affiliated, he, with which he was affiliated, was fundamentally communist in its, in its affiliation, mm -hmm. he saw that this was not gonna work and he, he, he blunted the power of the unions, for example, towards nationalization of industries. Where we are now is Nelson Mandela is no longer with us. We have uh, politicians of lower stature, who are inclined towards corruption. And I think South Africa is now perched on a knife's edge. It could go either way. It's still the richest country in Africa. It's still industrializing fast, but there are some ominous signs on the horizon as well. Well, I certainly hope that they, they go the way of free markets, but it's a tremendous journey that they've already made, of course, from where they were to what they are today. Absolutely. I right, thank you very much for, for joining us here on Free to Exchange. Thanks for having me, Ben. I hope you enjoyed today's show. The world has probably never seen a purely socialist regime. And of course, 
one of the main reasons for that is because they can't engage in the type of economic calculation that markets can to allocate resources. Maybe the Soviet Union under war communism at the beginning is about as close as the world has come to it. In the first half of the show, we learned how that Soviet system evolved and became an extremely hampered market economy with de facto property rights that weren't necessarily part of the central plan and the difficulties in reforming it. But yet that many of these former Soviet satellites have actually come closer to embracing free markets now and a great transition it's been. Second half of the episode, we learned about the apartheid system in South Africa, where socialist motivations of labor unions who didn't want to face competitions from poorer blacks are actually what drove the racist system there that was perpetuated in the second half of the 20th century. They too have made stri great strides towards markets. Hopefully they can both places continue in that direction. See you next time.